everyone and welcome to the fifth video of the Sustainable Aquaculture Program at Home Edition. Over the course of this series, we've looked at a general overview of what aquaculture is. We looked at different examples of aquaculture practices, some that were sustainable and others that were unsustainable. And in the last two videos, we looked at what scientists have to do to raise animals in an aquaculture farm. In the last video, we looked at two of the major factors in animal care, water quality and tanks. The health of the animals is very much determined by the health of the water that they're living in. And we looked at some of those water quality parameters. We also saw how tank design is very different depending on what animal you're raising. The animals, or sorry, the tanks that we looked at uh, were ones that you can find in an aquaculture farm, but they are not the only kinds of enclosures that you can actually find. Aquaculture enclosures can either be tanks that are inside of a farm, or they can be enclosures that are sitting out in the open, uh, open body of water. There are many different designs for these outdoor enclosures. Some are pens that are simply just placed in an open body of water, and these can vary in size depending on how much room the fish needs. They could either be floating up at the surface or they could be uh, hanging deeper down into the water depending on what depth the animal needs to live at. One of the biggest advantages to this kind of enclosure is that there is a constant flow of water. Since they're usually made out of netting, any of the waste that's produced will just flow out and be replaced by new water flowing back in. So as long as the surrounding environment is healthy, the water inside of the pen will be healthy as well. Enclosures can also be made in smaller scale ponds and lakes that are man-made. For something like this, freshwater animals that don't need a lot of room to swim would be ideal. And depending on if there's a natural source of water flowing through, water quality testing and changing out of water might be necessary. These types of enclosures may seem like a really great idea, however, there are some examples where they've gone wrong. In the 1950s, there was a species of carp that was being farmed in the Midwest in these same similar ponds and lakes. However, when, it, when there were really big rainstorms, those ponds overflowed and those carp that were not native to that area were able to escape into surrounding rivers and lakes. These carp ended up becoming an invasive species and to this day are still a major problem to much of the United States. Another type of enclosure are called raceway tanks. These can either be indoors or outdoors. These have water that's being constantly pumped into them and are ideal for animals that need a constant flow of water, such as trout, salmon, or abalone. The only downside to raceways, just like with the man-made ponds, is that there needs to be a source of water where the new water can be pumped in from. So these were just a few examples of the many different time types of aquaculture enclosures that are out there. And I encourage all of you to do your own research and to look up different types of interesting aquaculture enclosure designs. Now that we've learned about different enclosure designs and all the things that animals need to survive, you get a chance to get creative and test your knowledge by designing and making your own aquaculture enclosure. So before you get started designing your enclosure, there are a few questions that you, you should consider that will determine what it will look like. What kind of animal are you going to raise? It could be anything from fish to snails to even seaweed. What are you going to feed them? Where is your enclosure going to be placed? It could be in a river, a pond, a lake, or the ocean. How are you going to keep your enclosure clean? And then are there any other factors that you need to consider with your specific enclosure? And once you've thought about all of those factors, start by sketching out your design. This is what I imagined mine would look like. Now that we have an idea of what our enclosure is going to look like, it's time to collect supplies. You should use things that you already have lying around your house that will best match what you're trying to make. So these are some of the things that I found around my house that I thought would best match my design. 
But these are also some other things that you might be able to use as well. But get creative, because there's a lot of different things that you can find around your house that you can use. But of course, get your parents' permission before you take anything from your house. So this is the enclosure that I ended up making. I made it out of chopsticks and the netting that sometimes uh, like tangerines come in, twist ties, and these little fishing bobbers. If you're interested in watching how I made this, the clip of that will be at the end of this video. So let's go see how this floats in water. So the enclosure that I've made is meant to be in the ocean, somewhere close to shore. The top part will float at the surface, while the net below will hang in the sur underneath the surface of the water. I will be raising tuna, which will be fed a bait fish that I buy from a local fisherman. All the waste from the tuna will flow out through the net and new water will be replaced back in. If you guys want to try this at home, you can use the bucket of water like I did, or you can fill up a bathtub or a sink. And if you want to take it a step further, you can test the pH of your water using the method that we learned in the last video and try and match it to the pH of the water your fish should be living in. Thanks for joining the fifth video of the Sustainable Aquaculture Program at Home Edition. I hope you enjoyed getting creative by designing an aquaculture enclosure. Make sure to check out the next video, which will be the last of the series, where I teach you about the very important squid and I demonstrate a squid dissection. See you next time. So for those of you who are interested in watching how I built my enclosure, this is how I did it. I started by uh, cutting the chopsticks into four pieces and I wove them in between the netting, like you can see there. Then to attach the chopsticks to the netting, I used twist ties, which are those ones that you can find um, that come with bread packages or when you're buying produce at the supermarket. I just used those to twist them around the chopsticks and around the netting as well. So by doing this, I'm actually creating a frame at the very top of my netting just to kind of keep the netting open. And I noticed that they weren't staying very well. So I used a tiny little bit of super glue, which is very sticky, so be careful. Just a very tiny bit to help keep them in place. Make sure you get a parent's help with the super glue if you do need that. Okay, I had to wait for it to dry a little bit. A little more super glue. And then once the super glue was able to dry, I was able to use those fishing bobbers that I told you guys about and just attach them to the very top. And that's how I built my 